energy? Okay, I hope me too. So, in this room, we are entrepreneurs, investors, students, and activists. But above all, we are citizens of this world, sharing a common future, and especially a common home, one planet that we know. Climate change, uh, like you know, will greatly alter how we live, work, and communicate. Its implication will reshape every aspect of our life. But new actors will emerge, and new types of collaboration will see the day. The cost to adapt to climate change is around 70 to 100 billion dollars an expensive fiscal cost that governments around the world cannot meet alone. So that is why more than ever, we need a multi-stakeholder approach and innovative collaboration to achieve the transition towards a clean future. The next session will discuss the new actors and behaviors of the clean economy. But before that, please watch this video. We are all responsible. Every one of us can play a part in the clean tech acceleration. Citizens, NGOs, private sector, regulators, businesses, governments, new actors and activists must act for the development and promotion of clean technologies. Collaboration among all the partners will lead to new consumption behaviors geared towards building a cleaner, greener, more responsible and more prosperous economy. Perfect. So please welcome for this next panel, Jean Rognetta, Editor-in-Chief at Forbes and on our panelists. Please make some noise for them. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, please welcome Pedro Arias, Als Beta Klein, Miriam Maestroni, and Henry Nyakarundi. And I must start by thanking you all and Monte Carlo and the organizers, because the organizers in particular asked three questions that we're going to try to answer and that you'll find in your program. But the, the first answer, uh, the first question, I mean, is, who are the actors of the new economy? And now, answering that question will allow me not to introduce the people on my panel, since we actually have two actors of this new clean economy. So maybe the simplest way to begin in, is to introduce yourselves, and we'll start right away in the debate. Miriam Maestroni, how are you, and why are you here? Fine. I'm very happy to be here because actually I'm in my redemption phase. I spent 20 years in oil and gas business before I set the, my company called the Economy d'Energie, meaning that we work on energy efficiency. And actually in other countries it's called On5 Company uh, because all the energy comes from four origin in the universe and the fifth energy is the one we are not using. So the one, of course, no emitting CO2 and the cheapest one. And uh, I decided to set up the company seven years ago from scratch. And uh, today, Economy Energy is 200 people, half women, half men, which is something I think important to say. And uh, we have been, uh, we have been uh, doing uh, half a million work of energy efficiency in France in the past seven years, and also in Italy, uh, Spain, and UK, where we are starting as well. And uh, energy efficiency is part of the new issues mm -hmm. in, the, in the new world, because basically in Europe, we have 100 million houses, if I take just this example, over, over uh, consuming energy by uh, six to nine times more than the energy that would be uh, used if we were building new, uh, new houses uh, compliant with uh, building, uh, current building regulation. So this is a big issue. And of course, we are all concerned. The problem is that nobody is waking up in the morning saying, Ha, what I'm going to do uh, or, um, to, to save energy. So we thought that digitalization was a very good opportunity to bring all, uh, all, of, uh, all of us, any citizen, the option to start taking a, a step and to become a consume actor, which is a key issue. And how is the redemption of your soul proceeding, Miriam? 
I actually am very happy. I think that, uh, you know, the new energy world is based on conviction. I started back to 2004 with this, this idea. It has been very difficult for 10 years because I, I, back to 2004, I was managing a gas company. I was telling, we need to help our customer to save energy. And people thought I was crazy. You know what? After a couple of years, regulation came and said to the energy uh, companies, you need to help your customer to save energy. And it was for them like something completely, uh, you know, very counterintuitive. So for me, I was very happy. And I think that when I see what it is with people from 12 nationalities and uh, 32 years old, and really uh, interested in what is going to happen in this world, I'm very happy that I did that. Henry Nekarundi, you created Africa's, I believe, first renewable energy distributor. Is it really the first? Yeah, well, the, the, the technology. So anyway, we developed a solar kiosk uh, technology to revolutionize how distribution of services is done for low-income people. So let me give you guys a little bit of uh, context. Uh, most services uh, in Africa have been digitized. You have uh, airtime, mobile money, even government services now. But access to those services uh, for low-income pe people is very problematic. So we look at that ecosystem, and uh, we saw the opportunity of, of developing what we call a one-stop shop platform, which is our solar kiosk, to bring smart distribution of services. So customers can get any digital services, including phone charging, including uh, offline, online connectivity via Wi-Fi, all that from the, the platform. So we operate mostly in uh, rural area, semi-urban area, and also in refugee camps. And uh, we, we now in Rwanda and in Uganda. So it's, it's a tech for social good uh, type of business, you know, because uh, a lot of time when you, when you look at technology, there's a lack of inclusiveness in tech for, for, for the low-income people. But that's pretty much what we do as a business. So these are two of the actors of this emerging economy, but let's try to go one step up and have a helicopter look or even a satellite look. As Beta, you work for the International Finance Corporation, which is actually could I say a sister company to the World Bank? Absolutely. Yeah? Uh, can you be a sister company to the World Bank? You'll tell us about that. Anyway, you, you had the green side of the IFC. Absolutely. Thank you, Jean. So, uh, Osbert Akain, uh, Director and Global Head for Climate Business at the IFC, which is indeed a sister, uh, sister organization of the World Bank Group. So, uh, it takes a number of actors to make a difference in the new economy. And uh, I'm privileged to sit next to Miriam and Henry, who are playing their part in, in the transition, but it takes a few others to make it work. So who are these other players? First of all, it's the large companies. And uh, Miriam, I know you are trying to redeem your soul, but it's actually your companies that you worked with in the past that are making a huge difference today. So I'm just going to mention a couple of names. Um, Shell with its new sky scenario, which Okay, not perfect, but a great first step in starting to think about how to get to net zero economy in 20, 30, 40 years. We are seeing the same thing in emerging markets. Uh, in emerging markets, Mahindra stood up at the World Economic Forum. It's a large company out of India and said that their green transition is actually bringing financial returns. So the whole ecosystem of large companies is making a difference. Then you've got smaller companies, and Henry, you're probably part of that ecosystem and that part of the ecosystem. We are seeing it in a number of areas. We are seeing it in off-grid solar. We are seeing it in distributed generation. We are seeing in even electric vehicle startups that are making a difference. There are two more actors that are playing a role in this transition. Uh, the third one is regulators. Regulators are waking up to the possibilities that without a transition, they are running a number of risks. And uh, we in IFC run something called Sustainable Banking Network, where we have 35 regulators from emerging markets who are trying to green their own financial systems. And we don't tell them what to do, they actually learn from each other. So we've got a regulator from Bangladesh learning what a regulator in Sri Lanka has done, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is the last group, and that's investors. And investors are increasingly asking from their companies who are investing their assets, 
about green transition. So that demand is coming up, and it's coming up from younger people who uh, naturally care, and it's coming up from the generation that didn't care in the past, but are looking at aligning their values with their investment portfolios. And these are the four players, so large companies, small companies, regulators, and investors that, in my view, are making a difference in the transition. Well, the investors are just here. Pedro, I believe it's your turn. Good morning. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Amundi. Amundi is a global asset management company. I believe it's the eighth or tenth biggest global asset manager? Well, it's one of the, one of the top. It's, it's, it's the first non-American um, yeah. management company, just to say the other way around. Um, um, uh, Zbeta is completely right. I mean, as an investor point of view, what matters today and, um, and, uh, and tomorrow is really the appetite for the risk. So my business is not to have an opinion or a view upon the climate or whatever. It's really to find uh, investment uh, assets, uh, basically, um, that are coping the risk that I'm pricing in. So um, that's really the work that we're doing on behalf of investors. This is a growing, growing concern in the community of investors just because um, it's becoming a fiduciary duty to assess the risk of an asset taking into account a number of issues, and the climate is becoming one of the most obvious. And there's no need to overstate what has been said this morning or the day But yeah, yeah, let's do, because overstating makes it clearer, right, really, most of the time. Well, if, we, oh, if I overstate it, so then you can correct it. Um, what I understand has been happening has been that green indices have been overperforming normal indices and therefore it's the whole of your industry that is turning greener for no more no nothing nobler than just the profit motive yeah. is this accurate so That's are you in a way you the green man in amundi are you overtaking the whole company I, i'm not i'm not the green one uh, there are a number of friends that are more green than i am but i'm not conceptual at all so what i'm looking for is return that's the only way for me to convince a client, an investor, that could be a pension fund. So these funds that are actually uh, betting for us to, be, to, have a, to have a pension in the next 20, 30 years. So these guys, what they need to do is to invest on a profitable way, okay? So my job is really to find returns. What we've seen, and it's very much obvious today, is that, and we've started with indices, okay? is really by decarbonizing sorry, the indices, which is in a way over, uh, um, uh, uh, over investing in companies with a minor uh, uh, green, greenhouse gas footprint, carbon footprint. Obviously, you can I make it clear, if you underestimate in Volkswagen because they're building diesel engines, then you get a better financial return than if you, if you take just the big car makers at face value. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to focus on Volkswagen, but it's no, fair but to I say... No, but I anything. That but it's fair to, it's you fair said carbon imprint. Yeah, it's fair to say that, let's say, in, in 20 years, there will be less diesel um, than today. So if you need to bet on a car maker, you probably bet on Tesla rather than any other, okay? And just look at the market capitalization, market cap. It's obvious that as an investor, I mean, no need to emphasize on the climate transition or whatever. If you want to have a good return, you need to bet on Tesla rather than the others. So that's, that's our job. And that's really becoming, and, and, and once again, that's because that's critical. It's becoming a fiduciary duty, making the risk assessment needs to embed now the climate change, the climate change sorry, as one of the main concerns that we need to price in. And Tesla is actually a good example of this mix of entrepreneurship and institutional drive. But is it so, before we all take our hands and sing Kumbaya, is it so easy for entrepreneurs, uh, Miriam and then Henry? Well, easy. Uh, no, Miriam first, because I have a question. Oh, okay, no well, I think that is an interesting point to, uh, to say that big companies try to change and try to do that uh, uh, in partnership with smaller company that they didn't do uh, before. Actually, in the new ecosystem, I have to say that uh, the result we, we got were because big, large co companies 
uh, started trusting our new approach and we worked together. And what is amazing is that at the beginning we were just uh, playing with uh, what as Beta mentioned, which were energy players, because by law they were obliged to do that. But uh, it was a domino effect. So banks came in the game, hypermarket came in the game, do-it-yourself company came in the game. When they were not obliged. So the interesting question is, even post office in France is uh, uh, step in the game. Why? Because they are looking for organic growth, and they realize that uh, uh, they can find organic growth in this new business, which is, by the way, a kind of economy of uh, optimization, uh, uh, renovation. Uh, so I think that is interesting. And of course, as an entrepreneur, it's not easy. I self-finance my, uh, my company till now. But at the same time, I wouldn't be able to do that without this low, large corporation that trusted in our company. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, the regulatory uh, uh, framework, which is very important as well, because government should play their part in getting a proper regulatory framework where people are obliged to change. And then the domino effect starts, and uh, it's interesting. So not easy. Henry, sorry for cutting. No, no, no that's OK. Uh, I mean, um, uh, in Africa, it's a little bit different, all right? Um, one of the challenges is uh, the ecosystem in investment is fragmented, number one. Number two, it, we live in a global economy, right? So you see a lot of innovation in clean tech or any other innovation that come from abroad uh, to be developed in Africa. And if you look at how funding is, uh, funding is dispersed, um, those foreign companies get access to more funding than local uh, innovator, which is a big problem because it's a total lack of inclusiveness. So what you see is you have a lot of um, innovator, African innovator, that develop solution for Africa and have no access to funding. Um, but yet, there's a lot of capital, or I call it in international capital. And it's not just the capital problem, but it's also government policy that needs to be changed. So, and, and I always say, uh, if you empower uh, a local innovator, you're not just helping that company, but it creates jobs. It creates, uh, there's a byproduct where you have more engineer because they have to continue developing. 100% of our funding as ARED came from abroad to solve a problem on the continent of Africa. That, that, that's, that to me is a big, big problem that needs to be addressed. You know, uh, we're the youngest uh, continent and, and it's a continent that's gonna double in the next 30, 40 years. And, if, and has already started actually on the growth path. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. What happened these last years was amazing. Uh, am I no, no, that you out or because I think that the, qu the question you just put is a question for us beta client. No? The, uh, how to finance this entrepreneurial and environmental drive in Africa. That's absolutely critical because there are a number of myth, myths that we have in, in climate and climate business. And one of the myths that I keep hearing is that emerging markets have to develop exactly the same way as we have developed in the past in the developed markets. And I'd like to submit to all of you a hypothesis that emerging markets will develop very differently because of the technology that Henry was talking about. But it does need an intervention on a part of the government to do two things. First of all, you need to have good policies. And those policies have to enable the transition rather than hinder it. And we can go into details about what that means. And second thing you need to have is a level playing field. Jean, I have seen a study um, just last week from the UK which talked about carbon pricing and carbon taxes. And depending on which industry you are in the UK, carbon price can go from minus 50 pounds to plus 700 pounds. So some industries are taxed up to 700 pounds. For and that's carbon, the UK. And, some are, and, this is, and this is the UK, and this is where I'm talking about the need for level playing field. So entrepreneurs and established companies and all the others need to have certainty of the regulatory environment, and they need to have a level playing field so that these technologies can develop. Um, and this is something you told me. Uh, we were talking about intellectual property rights, but uh, I think this need for, uh, how do you say, more uniform regula regulatory environment and more stable in Africa is something you were already talking to me when we prepared this round table, Henry. Yeah, I mean, IP is, is, a, is a big issue. 
in Africa. You know, we, we, if you look at the statistic, um, we, most innovator in Africa don't register their IP. And we think because there is no uh, technology being developed in Africa, but that's not true. It's just expensive. So your IP has to be registered in every country, talking about 50 plus countries. It's very expensive. You know, we are a startup. We are already starving for cash. We're not going to allocate money on IP. If you do an IP in Europe or in the States, it's, it's one process, right? Um, in Africa, every pro we try. We did an IP in Rwanda, and it took three years to get our, our, uh, the IP registered, three years. By the time we got the IP, the technology had changed. And now you, you have to multiply this by whatever country we're going to, so we start. So there should be one IP registration, for example, that is cost effective, you know. Uh, same thing, you know, it's business registration is also a, a problematic in different countries you go to. So if you build a technology that plan to expand, now you have to register your company in, every do in, in all those countries, hire a lawyer and all. So it's, it's, it's such a fragmented market. It's very difficult to, to expand. That it does sound a bit like Europe as well, though. I hear things <laughs> like that told about the European Union. Uh, anyway, there always are regulatory problems, and then there is finance. Um, did the, you, you had a green bond operation between the two of you, Pedro and Elspeth. Perhaps you will care to talk about it, particularly if it has an African dimension or it leads some of the investment goes to Africa. Pedro, you want perhaps to talk about this? Yeah, maybe if you... Yeah, you yeah, start and I'll then pitch. Absolutely. I mean, th this is, uh, um, once again, to underline the fact that uh, it, it's much more easier for us to start with the large companies to invest in before investing in smaller companies, just because the investors First of all, they would like to have their money deployed in companies they know. So there's nothing to do against that, just, just to wait until uh, the investors are well educated and, and ready to take an additional risk, which could be the African one or a sector specific one. And to tackle this issue, what we've done after the indices is to uh, team up with the IFC in order to share basically the risk, okay? So we've, we've set up a fund a green bond fund for emerging countries whereby the banks on the ground will lend money to dedicated projects that could be small or medium-sized projects, uh, obviously green, okay, or towards tr the climate transition, and, um, and they will be refinanced by the fund we, we are co-managing. The IFT is taking, I would say, the riskiest part of the investment, if there's anything going wrong, and the other investors that we've pulled into the fund will take, I would say, the less riskier part of the, of the, of the investment, which in a way creates a, a good momentum because if you avoid the risk of the currency, for instance, or the regulation or the political issues, then obviously it's becoming an investment that you can compare in relative terms with any other investment across the globe. And that's really pretty much what the investors would like to do. Okay, so after the phase of the indices, digging into the assets will require a, sh a, a, a risk sharing mechanism that still need to be worked on, but this is a, I mean, this is a pretty good example with the AFC. Yeah, because in a way you go from passive investment that just track indices, mm -hmm. and we're talking about decarbonating indices, yeah. to active investment, uh, which is actually taking risk and, and there, you, you do some de-risking magic, Elspeth? Yeah, de-risking magic, that? but I think it actually goes further, Jean, because it actually creates the market. So yep. I'm very proud that my organization, IFC, was a third issuer of green bonds uh, in the world. Uh, EIB was ahead of us, and so was the World Bank. We were the third issuer, so if green bonds can have three parents, we are one of them. Um, and so then we issued a bunch of bonds on our own balance sheet, so we learn how to do it. Again, sort of going back to my first statement, which is, Big companies can make a difference, and then small companies will play as well, right? So for ourselves, we are not a big company, but we are probably one of the players in the, in the international financial architecture. So we learn how to do it on our own balance sheet. And then we started seeing our clients, banks in emerging markets, who wanted to do the same thing. Why did they want to do the same thing? Because they had customers in renewables. They had clients in energy efficiency. So once they learn how to finance green, they said, okay, let us issue a bond, let us issue a green bond and play in that part of the market. And then the third step came, which was our idea to set up a bond fund, which would start uh, purchasing those green bonds from 
financial institutions in emerging markets and bring them to investors. So you are creating supply in a market, you are creating demand in a market, and then you marry the two, and that's the fund that we have at Amundi. But then we saw that investors were not too keen on some of the risks, so they probably would go to, say, Mexico, but they were not too keen to go to, say, I'm going to pick a country, Zambia. Or, or so, Rwanda. <laughs> or Rwanda, for that matter. So uh, we set up a, uh, a junior tranche, uh, a tranche of funding that is underpinning the investors, and that's coming from IFC, that's about $250 million. And based on that, we managed to bring in additional $1.2 billion of commercial capital, which Amundi uh, is now managing. So, so we're talking about $1.5 billion globally? $1.5 but we are looking to reach about $2 billion because, of course, the funds will recycle. I, I, I think funds. Miriam wants a share of it. Yeah, because I think it's interesting to uh, realize that uh, eventually it's easier to uh, finance large companies because, of course, uh, they have a, a long experience. Uh, but one of the points is, uh, which I puzzle me, is that, of course, they have a large experience in infrastructure and in building infrastructure. And for many years, they have been building uh, their activity uh, top-down with uh, all the attention on supply chain because it was about uh, uh, div diversity and security of supply. But uh, in the new world, what I observe is that, in my view, we should speed up so much that we will not be able to do that without all the citizens. And I believe that uh, this is a very important issue that uh, customer centricity. And many times in large organization, they just lost the habit to really pay full attention to the customers. So we have a conflicting issue, which is actually uh, something weird because digitalization is very much based on customer uh, uh, centricity and is where uh, by teaming up with large companies and small companies, we can do things that large companies cannot do uh, by themselves. So I think that uh, one of the key issues in that is really uh, to look for customer, to look for money, of course, but also to look for customer and to be able to convince customer to use those things that make sense for them. And sometimes just financing infrastructure, these infrastructure are not making sense for them. Henry, please. Sorry, um, I, I just want to add something that was not uh, uh, spoke about, you know, because uh, one of the gap that is missing is research and development money. So before we talk about expansion and, and growth and all those things, we have to have a technology. We have to test the technology. Uh, it, it took us about five years to develop our latest technology. That, that is a huge gap we need to fix. Now, I don't know who will fix that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a micro. Uh, econ economist uh, uh, guy, but that, that's also aspect because we're pushing innovation, we're pushing young men and women to develop solution to the problem we're facing today, but we're not giving them the capital to do so. That's the big problem, number one. Number two, number two is the seed capital, you know, so, so you have grants uh, uh, for research and development and you have seed capital. Those are the two areas before we even go to growth. If we don't fix those two, there's not going to be that much growth in, in a lot of companies. Yes, there'll be some big and traditional companies, but they'll still be the same guys that, you know, dominate the market. We need to fix that, too. That's, that's the most important, at least to me. Well, that's going to be a, a tough one for the finance world. <laughs> uh, so anybody cares to... Okay. See how, how you go down from large caps down happy to, to happy seat. To Please, us better. So I'd like to support what Henry said because I think innovation is going to come through small companies. And we have see, seen time and again in Africa and elsewhere that it's smaller companies that are bringing innovation to the market. I'd like to uh, mention one of them called Mobisol, which is a company doing off-grid solar in Uganda and actually in Rwanda, in your country. Uh, and a couple of others, they have about 70,000 households uh, of grid uh, with sizable solar installations. They are not part of any big company, they are a small company, they are a startup. They got funding actually from us and many others. And there are a number of others who are doing the same thing. We are seeing a battery storage company out of Madagascar, which is powering telephone towers. This is not a large company, this is a startup. And the innovation that we are observing uh, in many areas of energy storage, off-grid, 
distributed generation are not coming from large companies. They're coming from small companies. Now, how do they get funding? That's actually a critical question because maybe we should set up a fund for, uh, for some of the smaller companies uh, to, to grow uh, alternative energy in, in Africa. But these companies are grown from the ground up and they are making it work in Africa, and they are essential to developing energy access in Africa. Uh, Pedro, your strategy has been to create specific funds. One, the bond fund we talked about with us better, but also infrastructure funds, and I believe a venture fund. Yes, absolutely. But, but it's probably not a direct answer, but perhaps you can try to. Well, I think uh, regarding this, uh, th this question, we will probably uh, face the issue that has been discussed this morning about the cost of the equity, the cost of the capital that you put at work in, the, in this project. The, the, what, whatever we think personally, but the, the, the issue that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm in charge of at Amundi is really to, man to manage pension funds, basically. So out, out of the 1.4 trillion euro to be invested, already invested, um, behind that you have actually you and I, and we want to have returns on these funds because this is gonna pay our pensions. So in a way, I mean, we need to create an ecosystem, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm pretty pushing uh, for that, but keeping in mind that the channeling the money, our money, to these projects, whatever we think, and, and, and we will probably all think that these are good projects, we need to have returns. Otherwise, we're gonna create a bigger problem than the one we're trying to solve. And uh, having that, I mean, this is our, this is our, what we need to, a roadmap. Um, obviously, the straightforward way to start to invest is through passive investment, so the indices, and it's fair to say that indices are for large companies. Okay, and the second phase that is probably starting a start recently and will increase over the years is as, as long as we educate our people, our clients, towards it makes sense to be invested in Rwanda or Uganda because in terms of risk and return, this is the kind of product you will have. Um, unless we do that and we find that point, it's gonna be very much difficult to channel the money, and once again, the money is our money, okay, um, to these, these assets. And we're working on it, okay, and the financial institutions are working on it, sometimes mixing, blending, public money with private money, and it makes a lot of sense, but it's a progress. And, uh, and uh, I'm pretty confident, as of today, Amundi and the other asset managers, we are increasing our exposures to climate change and emerging countries. This will continue, but it takes time, and I need to assume that it takes time, and it's not that a bad idea because we need to educate our people. Okay. Uh, perhaps, uh, what, what you say boils down to the fact that uh, you, to go uh, into innovation in Europe can be possible, th or Europe or America, uh, can be possible through a specific fund, but emerging markets, and Africa in particular, are a more complicated reality where uh, a public intervention is necessary, or am I? You're gonna, you're gonna find me boring, but once again, it, 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 it ties into the risk assessment. Uh, we have the same issue in Asia. I mean, when you have 20 or 15 regulatory different environments, it's very much difficult to know if it's better to invest in a project in Uganda or Rwanda or Congo. I mean, uh, it takes time, it takes money to invest because you need to invest in people on the ground and, and to dig into the regulation, the legal framework and that kind of stuff. And it's obvious to say that it's still more easy in Europe where we have what, at least one, uh, one framework of agreement. Uh, so it's much more easy and, uh, and to explain to our clients and users that this is the kind of technologies we're investing in I mean, the echo is much more easy if you invest locally than abroad in Africa. I mean, we don't, we, we're not even in Africa yet in equities, listed equities. So before being there for uh, non-listed projects in the green industry, it will take a little bit more of time, except if we team up with uh, um, uh, a multilateral bank or, or a friend of IFC, whereby once again, they will avoid 
the final investor to take the full risk of it. It's, uh, that, that's what I, so it could be a role for IFC or what's Look, a friend uh, of IFC? We have, been, we have been in this business for over 60 years. Uh, we are the largest investor in emerging markets and we actually love Africa and we love risk and we love investing in emerging markets. That's what we do day in, day out. But there is a couple of things that we can do to uh, push green transition in those markets. So uh, what Pedro was saying is that European pension funds are too scared to go to Africa today. But what about African pension funds? What about savings that are in the markets? And this is where you are working with the local financial institutions in those markets to be able to uh, help them invest in a green transition in their own markets. We've seen it in Latin America already for the past 30 years because they reformed the pension system and they have a pension pool that is investing in Chile, for example, and in many other places. And we're starting to see some of it in Africa as well, from South Africa up, up through the continent. So the money is there, but we need to find mechanisms, both through blended finance, through grants, through basically a number of tools to be able to de-risk those projects and invest in them. I, I had a feeling that the room and or yourself, Henry, felt that the money is there? Uh, yes, uh, the money is there. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, we've, we've, we've got most of our money through grants competition. There is money out there. That's, let, let's not fool ourselves and think there's no money. The problem is how do you channel that money? That's the issue, you know? When you have company that are getting uh, the majority of the capital and then the rest of us, you know, are not able to access, and there's a lot of issue. We, we're not gonna debate about that, but uh, it will take forever. But the, 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 the question is, how can we democratize access to capital where an African company can access to the same fund as a foreign company? Because let, let's not forget, and uh, the example that was given, uh, Mobisol, great company, uh, I know them personally, but it's still a foreign technology, and I can only speak for Africa. You know, we're not gonna build the African ecosystem of the clean tech with foreign technology. That's not gonna happen, you know? We need to build our own technology, and we need to get funding for that. That's the key. This is the, uh, multi a bit like the multi-stakeholder approach that you were having, Miriam. Well, actually, I would add to that, that I don't know so much Africa, but uh, I can tell you that when you are talking about energy transition, it's not easy for women either, because I, w I used to be the only one at the top 100 of my company before, and uh, right now I really choose to have uh, half women, half men. And I do believe that women can play a part on that because this is a very a much more holistic approach of uh, the business instead of having a step-by-step -step, uh, way to, to approach it as, uh, as we used to do in the, in the past world. Once I've said that, in my situation, uh, it's true that I had to make my proof. Today, uh, to be honest, I have people willing to fund, uh, to fund the company and I hope that I will do that to accelerate the growth. But it has been a long run before getting to this point. And uh, it was really about proving uh, for 10 years that uh, the idea could be okay and, that, and to get the trust of, uh, of people willing to work with us. So this is, uh, this is an issue. The second one I think that we shouldn't uh, under this underestimate, even in Europe, because Europe is kind of uh, a very fragmented market in the energy uh, business, even if we have a European directive uh, trying to get uh, the sense of what uh, we should do. And um, uh, today, regulatory framework are still very different from the, in the different country, in the way they are they applied in the different markets. Spain is not the same than uh, Italy or UK. Uh, most of the time in energy efficiency, B2B is privileged on, the, on household uh, market, for example. And on the top of that, the period of time regulators are working are not enough to invest uh, properly. So we have three, one to three years a period of time when we might uh, get some more visibility uh, for all of us. So I think that all help, uh, all help. Uh, I, this agreed, but that is still too optimistic, still too, let's hold our hands and think. No, uh, I want, uh, since we're, at the end of it, I would just would like to put a pessimistic question, okay? Your ecosystem, ladies and gentlemen, has been built for, well, the Club of Rome was 1971, if I remember, so for, say, 50 years, more give or take, um, on a, a, a rising tide of 
public opinion and government approval that has been um, uh, helping entrepreneurs and the people that finance them and the whole energy transition. Nobody, uh, if I miss, unless I missed it, nobody has uttered so far in this morning the T word, you know, the, the name of the president of the, that took the United States out of the Paris Accord. Uh, so I'll try not to pronounce the T word either, but don't you, f is your ecosystem strong enough to survive a political storm or the fact that the general political consensus that we need the transition is apparently breaking down? It is your company, are your companies and your whole ecosystem strong enough? I'll let you all take the question in turn, the way you like. Miriam. Well, but just very I shortly, that, 30 uh, seconds. Unfortunately, uh, uh, everything is speeding up, including the, the, the climate change, which is now an urgency, a complete urgency. So we have 20 years to sort out things and not uh, 100 years, as you saw uh, five years ago. So that helps. Now, if you ask for my business, uh, without a proper regulatory system, my business uh, uh, still a uh, good business, but uh, the development will be 50% uh, of what it has been. So it's true that uh, there is a very, Im very important articulation between the role of the state speeding up and the business, even if the business without any, and, and uh, United States is proving, is proving that, without any f uh, legal framework, realize that uh, today, it's uh, profitable to invest uh, in green economy. And actually, for the first time, our business review last uh, January said it is profitable to invest in green economy. Thanks, God. I'll pick, up on, that, yes, please. I'll pick up on that. Look, uh, every year, the world invests $300 billion plus in renewables. $300 billion. If you count all the multilateral institutions, EIB, EBRD, IFC, you name it, you're going to get $5 billion which tells you that 295 billion is commercial money. Somebody is putting that money into the green economy, and believe me, they're not doing it because of the charity. They're doing it because there are returns. We have seen time and again that green means profitable, and that's what makes me a believer in this transition. It makes sense to invest in the green economy transition. Pedro Arias. No, I, I, can, I can only agree. I mean, basically, that's that's the point. Uh, uh, my job is really, to, and our job is really to find profitability at first stance, and afterwards, um, becoming uh, uh, you know convinced that the green economy is part of those sectors where we need to invest. But I would put it this way rather than the other way around. I mean, we're not starting from the concept. Whoever can think whatever he wants but really on the profitability, which will drive and channel the private investment towards these assets. That's, that's, that's the key, basically, to me. Henry, you will have le mot de la fin. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the ecosystem, uh, it's a risk, but it's a risk everywhere. You know, uh, uh, part of being an entrepreneur is uh, enjoying the risk that you take to solve a big problem. So I don't, I don't focus on the risk, I, I focus on the solution. And I believe that this is the best time to be an entrepreneur because the problems are massive, uh, the issues are big, and we need solutions. So I don't, you know, that, that's what I look for. I look at risk as an opportunity. So it wasn't really kumbaya, it was we shall overcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for this very interesting discussion. You can make some noise and I'll applaud them. <laughs> Thank you.